title of our message or our study today is A Life of a Fool. A Life of a Fool. And of course, with a title like that, you might be thinking, well, you know, I don't really want to listen to the message today. I'd rather uh, hear about the life of a success of, uh, you know, somebody who did something good, not a life of a fool. And uh, such is really the attitude of, of the world we live in. But there are lessons to be learned from, from this message. And uh, I'm reminded back in the days of when we used to travel by planes and go to airports and visit other countries, uh, back in those days, if you recall them, uh, one thing I always uh, like to do uh, when I was waiting at an airport is going to the bookstore. And uh, one section in the bookstore that's uh, many times very popular is the biography section. The biography section is all the books uh, and stories of the people in the world who are considered rich, famous, and successful, the celebrities. And they basically write their story uh, or get someone to write their story. But it's a record of their story. And people are always interested in, in uh, reading the the life of a successful person. How did they do it? Maybe we can learn something. They look up to that. And uh, it kind of gives you, and this is what I like, kind of gives you a little bit of a feel going to, into such a bookstore. It gives you a feel of uh, what, what what is the world looking at? What is what is trending? What is popular? What are people reading? You know, presidents, ex-presidents, uh, celebrities, uh, you know, CEOs of companies they put their books out there and people uh, love to read them. Uh, of course, they're celebrated. They look to up to highly, they are seen as examples to follow. But uh, often, actually, if the truth be known, and if you consider God's opinion, the Bible actually says that that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Now, that's not to say that all these successful people are, are you know, the opposite of what they put out. But just keep in mind that in this world we live in, it is richly peppered with hypocrisy uh, plus some. So keep that in mind. God's estimation is not like man's. But the interesting thing is in these uh, book sections or these uh, you know, biographies, you don't really see biographies lining the bookshelves of the people that uh, the world would call losers, unachievers, failures. You don't see the biography of such and such failure or loser. Nobody would read it. Nobody would, would be interested uh, in it. It would definitely uh, not be a bestseller. Today, we are going to look at the life story of a self-confessed fool. And there are lessons to learn from it. What the world might shun or not read or, or think, well, it's not worth my time. Uh, in the Bible, we have actually uh, biographies of uh, success, great success that we can learn from, and also biographies of people who were a failure. And that is written and given to us as an honest declaration of reality and as a lesson for us to learn from. So today's uh, biography is... Uh, this life of a fool. And the verse, of course, comes from the man who uh, was a self-confessed fool. And it's none other than King Saul. And here's what he says. First Samuel 26 and verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Here is uh, Saul, King Saul, chasing David. Uh, David uh, pardons him or, you know, he, he spares him. He doesn't kill him when he had the opportunity. And uh, it really strikes Saul that uh, David, spare, you know, spared his life. He's alive because of him. He recognizes for, for a fleeting moment what he has been caught up in. And he gives a summary. And this is towards, you know, the, the end of his life, you know, later on in his career. This is not early on. And he gives a summary, a stark summary of what his decisions have been like. And it's really a summary of his whole life, even though these were not his last words, even though this was not the last thing he ever said, but he played the fool. And sadly, in the story of Saul, King Saul, this self-confessed fool, we actually have this life where we can learn so much. It did not have to be the way it did, uh, you know, the way things happened for King Saul. It did not have to happen that way, but it did. And we want to see what lessons we can learn from that today as we look at this particular story, which is, like I said, it's a very sad, one of the saddest stories, really, uh, in the scriptures. Uh, so keep in mind that the Bible gives us the good and the bad. The Bible is honest. The Bible doesn't just put uh, for us heroes or, you know, uh, celebrities to celebrate and, uh, and look at their success and, and nothing other, nothing negative. It gives us a true picture, a true, real picture of what these people were like, the good and the bad, in order for us 
to learn. Uh, we like the good. We look up to it. Uh, to those who are, you know, like the example of the faithful men recorded in Hebrews 11, we're inspired by their faith. We look up to them. But also the bad or those who, like Saul, self-confessed fool, we can actually learn something from these lessons. It's a really sad commentary if you think about it because God chose King Saul to be the first king of Israel. Israel wanted a king, of course. It wasn't God's idea. It was Israel's idea. And, and they wanted a king because they wanted to be like the nations all around them. And God told them, this is, this is not the best idea. This, this and this will happen. But they insisted, no, no, no. We want a king to go before us in battle and judge us and to be like all the other nations. And uh, so God said, okay, we will give you a king. And in choosing a king, God told Sa uh, Samuel uh, that they were not just rejecting Samuel. It wasn't really about rejecting Samuel because Samuel was a bit upset. He said they're rejecting me. So here's a little brief uh, lesson we can learn from Israel. Are we in our decision-making influenced by looking at all the others all around us? Because that was the first step for Israel wanting a king. They wanted to be like the other nations. They didn't, look at, they didn't look at the example of those who were good, noble, faithful, obeying God. They looked at the other nations, the pagan nations, and they said, we want to be like them. And they chose that despite God's warning. And that's really what paved the way for King Saul to be King Saul. He wasn't King Saul yet, of course, but God... God chose him. So keep in mind this, this particular lesson. Do you sometimes know what to, you ought to do, but you think, well, no, I'll just, I'll just do this. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Because look, look over here. Look, look what everybody else is doing. Well, you know, it's okay. I, I, I want to do it too. And uh, is this how you make decisions? Beware. Israel fell into that trap. Of course, uh, the choice of God for a king was a good choice. Uh, he picked someone that they, they, they could all look up to. And uh, not just physically, literally, he was, he was a tall man. He was handsome. He was from a good family. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he was handsome. He had a, a kingly bearing. Uh, he was tall. He had a kingly bearing. And so he had some very good qualifications, external qualities. He, he worked with his father. He had respect for his father. When his father's uh, donkeys were lost, he went to look for them. He was humble enough to take the advice of his servant. They went looking for Samuel. I'm just recounting a, a brief a summary of, of the highlights of the progression of the story of this young man, Saul, who became King Saul, who ended up saying, I have played the fool and ended his life in such a tragic, tragic way. So, so many lessons. Uh, today, I'll just try and pick a few uh, and highlight them. Despite the external appearances and promise that outwardly everything looked good, he was handsome, he was a good family and, and humble initially, uh, there was something on the inside that Saul had not really dealt with, even though he became king. And we will see that as we go along. Certain habits, certain tendencies that he held onto that later on manifested and they had never been thrown off. They, they came back and they haunted him and they actually ended up causing his destruction. So don't just be deceived by outer appearance. Don't think that because you have an outward appearance of all good and well, and you neglect the inner work of what really matters within. This is another uh, interesting component here, another warning. But here he is anointed by Samuel to be king. And in his anointing, he actually received a certain measure of blessings, uh, blessings that we can actually relate to. Uh, here it is, 1 Samuel 10 and verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head, that's Saul's head, and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? So here is the start of King Saul. We looked at the end and now we're reflecting back on the start, we want to see how he got to this end where he says, I have played the fool. And we see at the commencement, at the start of his life, uh, particularly his life as a king, he was anointed by the prophet of God. God chose him. He says, you are captive over his inheritance, over his people. And the question really has to be asked. I don't know if you've ever wondered about this. It's a, it's a pondering question or reflecting question because it naturally comes up in the context of this particular story. Did God make a good choice or a poor choice in selecting Saul as king. Well, at the beginning of his life, it all looked good and promising. We have the advantage of hindsight where we see what happened to this king. So did God make a good choice or a bad choice? The fact is God gave to Saul every needed blessing, every necessary blessing, he even gave him his spirit as we will see. And Saul did not have to end up the way he did. The fault was not in God's choice. The fault was actually in how Saul responded and appropriated or squandered the blessings of God and the choices that he made. And he made some very foolish choices. Don't miss the point. We can have a good start like that. 
we can be, we are all called to be anointed, to be, to receive the spirit of God, to be, to be given, uh, you know, talents entrusted with gifts, to be able to bless others in a, in a measure, in a sense, uh, you know, like Saul was to lead his people. We are to be dispensers of the blessings that God gives us to others. How do we respond? What is the uh, outcome of our life at the end? Starting well is good, but it doesn't guarantee the outcome at the end. And this is what we want to examine. Here's what I'm saying when it comes to these blessings that this man received as well. Uh, 1 Samuel continuing verse, verses 9 and 10. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And so Saul came to be known as among the prophets, it was one of the prophets because he, he was given another heart. Uh, the spirit of God came upon him. Uh, God blessed him in a rich, rich way. And this is what we're seeing here. And not only that, but it was perceived and seen by others. So I want us to pause here and keep making the application. I don't want to get lost in the details of the story of Saul and just recounting it. I want to make sure we are drawing parallels today. We can be like that, brothers and sisters. We can be chosen by God, receive the spirit of God, receive gifts Gifts that are even apparent and perceived by others and recognized. This is why the people said, oh, is, is Saul even among the prophets? And it was a saying in Israel. So other people recognized that Saul was anointed by God. He had the spirit of God. Something was different about this man. A great start. Fantastic start. You would never, ever guess with such a start like that for King Saul that he would end up where he did. Which is why this story serves as such a vital warning lesson that is so applicable for us today. Because so many of us start with these blessings, just like Saul, receiving the spirit of God, giving gifts, blessings, chosen for this high and great calling. That's fantastic. And nobody can guess what the outcome at the end might be, especially if it's a tragic one. Nobody would ever guess that such, there, is, there might be a tragic ending for someone who starts so well. And this is why this is such an important warning lesson for us. Saul, at the close of his life, actually confessed. He said, I have played the fool. And, and the tragic ending of his life is, is a testament and a warning for us. So here's another lesson and a point here. A good start does not guarantee a good finish. Okay. In other words, this is a theological point here we can also make. Once saved doesn't mean always saved. Just because you were blessed and called by God at the beginning doesn't guarantee that this is how you remain at the end. There is something in the interim along the way that you have to maintain, that you have to preserve, that you have to walk, making certain choices, commitments, surrenders to ensure that what is promising at the beginning ends up being realized consistently with that promise uh, or with that promising uh, start to have a promising end or a good outcome, unlike King Saul. It's a strange. Look, I'm going through the story of, of King Saul with my girls. Honestly, it, it is such a tragic, tragic story. It's one of the saddest stories in the Bible. You, if you think about it, and we have, and, and you, you really get a rich measure of, of how tragic and dramatic it is because we have a rich amount of detail about the story of this man. And this is where we can really pause. This is the reason why these things are recorded. We can pause, look at that, and make applications for us and see what can I learn? What will my life be like? at the end of it, when I reflect back on it, what about the choices that I've made, the things that I've clung to, the blunders I've done, will they color my life in such a way that they will alter the course of my life? Now I'm talking about not just, you know, somebody who's, who's in the world or unconverted, who hasn't, hasn't given their life to Christ. Saul was a man chosen by God. He started off well with the spirit of God and look where he ended. Uh, an amazing, amazing uh, story with great lessons for us. So with this great commencement, Saul's star, so to speak, began to fade. And we start seeing here now some of the, 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 the roots or some of the seeds, really, before they take root, see their seeds first, some of the seeds of this folly or foolishness that he admitted and he confessed about at the end. Uh, this particular story, like I said, we'll just look at some highlights. There's so much detail. I, I will not be able to go through all the detail, but we'll just pick a few. But this particular story here in 1 Samuel 13 and verse 12, Saul begins to presume. Let me read the passage and then give you some context to see what is happening here. Therefore said I, Saul speaking, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. He was speaking to Samuel. 
Okay, he was supposed to wait for Samuel for seven days uh, with the with the men. So Samuel could come. Samuel being the the priest, he would come and offer the sacrifice. And they waited, and and Samuel was a little late. So Saul forced himself, therefore, and took upon himself the uh, work and the uh, the task of the priest in offering the sacrifice, and he did it in the place of Samuel. Now, this was a grave, grave mistake because it was not given. It wasn't for him to offer the sacrifice. This was not his job. This was not something he was entrusted with. This was something that the priest would do. And Samuel came as it was happening. You know, he, if he had just waited a little longer. But notice here, uh, this gives us an insight that Saul had begun to take upon himself and to view himself in a certain way. He took upon himself a certain uh, you know, view that he, he was king. He was important. Why should he wait? You know, the people are looking to him. Why should he wait for Samuel? And he, he will do it. And he presumed to do something that was not given to him. It's actually a direct violation and contradiction of what God had instructed. And, and Samuel told him as much. So point to take note of here in this segment, pride and self-importance. Saul might have been humble at the beginning, but being entrusted in a position of leadership and being blessed mightily, the temptation for him was to start feeling self-important and proud. And he did. And this is seen in how he acted. The blessing of God to him actually generated self-importance in him. What are the blessings of God in your life causing you to do? How do you see yourself? Do you start seeing yourself as important as, you know, pride creeps in? Because this is a very real temptation, especially if you are in, in the work, in the Lord's work, and you are entrusted with a position of leadership, maybe you are blessed with an ability to speak, to share, to study the Bible, to lead out. And, and many times, like Saul, the temptation is a certain measure of pride and self-importance comes in. And he dared and presumed to do that which was not his to do. And he was severely rebuked for it. But his excuse here is self-justification. He doesn't acknowledge it, says, I'm sorry. He actually says, you know what? The circumstance pushed me to do this. In other words, Samuel, your delay, you were late and you put me in this position where I forced myself and the people were getting scattered and they were running and where is the prophet? And, and so I had to, you know, uh, do this thing, which I didn't really want to. I had to do this thing and I forced myself and it's really your fault. Does that sound familiar? That's, that's uh, what started in the Garden of Eden. Not only did he make a mistake, a foolish mistake, he did not really acknowledge it. He did not take responsibility for his actions. He actually justified himself. Again, this is another manifestation of pride and self-importance. Yeah, the problem, yeah, a mistake happened, but it's not my fault. It's the fault of all these other people. All these other people all around, this one and that one, the other one, and this circumstance and this pressure, and this is, this is why it happened. This is not, you can't, you can't blame me for what happened. That's the excuse. Don't be a fool like Saul. This was a seed of foolishness that actually grew into a root and developed the fruit. And we see the end result in the life and the end of this man. And so uh, here is how Samuel tells Saul what happened. This is why we're saying this is a seed of foolishness. Because uh, in the next verse, Samuel replies to him. First Samuel 13, 13. And Samuel said unto Saul. Samuel said to Saul, sorry. Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. So he's telling him, uh, Saul, in doing this, you have done foolishly. You have acted foolishly. And acting foolishly, you have actually endangered the stability of the kingdom and your position as king over this kingdom. You don't want to have a fool for a king. Sam, uh, Saul, in acting foolishly and in justifying his foolish act, by, by blaming others was actually showing that he had this seed, he had this problem, it was endangering his position, his calling, and therefore the standing of the kingdom as far as him being a king was concerned. So in a time of crisis and pressure, Saul disregarded the command of God. He justified it to himself. How do you act in a time of crisis and pressure? Saul was impatient. He felt he was important enough to do that which God had not commanded him to do, which God had put exclusively in the domain of the priests. And he presumed and he was foolish in so doing and he defended his foolishness. How do you act? How do I act? In times of pressure, in times when we feel circumstances are, are pushing us a certain way. Are we presuming? Do we have a certain measure of self-importance? And 
when we mess up, do we justify our actions or do we take responsibility for what happened? Do we act foolishly or not? That is the question. So Paul, uh, Saul continued in this track, sadly. God gave him an instruction to go through Samuel to go and wipe out the Amalekites, if you remember. He told him, go wipe them all out. Don't take any uh, spoils. Don't take any captives. Just wipe out the whole nation of the Amalekites. And uh, Saul continued to act in this self-important, prideful way. In other words, see, what, what was happening with Saul is he felt he knew better than God. This is how much the self-importance had gotten to his head. He felt he knew a little better than God in certain areas. Well, God says do it this way, but we could do it this way. And this way is a much better way. And this is how he justified, to, justified it to himself and how he excused it when Samuel came and reproved him. So when he told him to go to uh, destroy the Amalekites, uh, if you recall the story, here's what happened. First Samuel 15, 15. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So you recall what happened. Samuel came and he told them, Saul, what, did you do what the Lord said? He said, sure, I've done what the Lord did, said. And Samuel tells him, what's this bleating of the sheep and uh, oxen? What's, what's the sound of the animals I'm hearing? Saul, the, the evidence says otherwise. So he disobeyed, lies, and justifies himself. You see, see a developing pattern here. This is a sad problem. Pay careful attention, brothers and sisters. There are parallels for us today. Saul is not the only one who started off well, who ended up bad. We need to avoid falling into that trap. And so he explains and justifies. He says, they, that's the people. The people brought these animals from the Amalekites because these people, they thought, well, we will spare the best sheep and oxen to sacrifice to God. I'm doing God a favor. So uh, Samuel, I, I, these, these uh, animals, the people thought it's, it's for God. And this is for God. This is, what, what, what are you going on about? And so many times, it seems like Paul's, uh, sorry, Saul's answer here is political, expedient, seems great. What a great idea, logical, sensible. And yet it goes directly contrary to what God had said. Samuel seems to be pedantic, picky. Uh, why did you save these animals? And Saul seems to be large hearted and generous. Let's save these animals and we offer them as a sacrifice to God. Beware of the excuses that we use to justify foolish decisions we make which is really disobedience, self-justification. Beware of that. It all stems from pride. Does that mean that we can start with the Lord? We can, we can begin our Christian journey, receive the spirit of the Lord. And somewhere along the way, we can still have pride pop up and actually cause us trouble. The answer is yes, according to the story of Saul. The answer is a resounding yes. This is a grave danger. And this is why we're saying, just because you started off well, doesn't mean you will end off well. So he uh, gave in to the people. And it was his idea too, it wasn't just the people. He blamed the people like uh, Eve did in the Garden of Eden, like Aaron did when he made the golden calf and uh, justified sin by blaming others. Here is Samuel's reply, and now this is getting very serious. And this gives us a little bit of a, a warning prediction of what might transpire in the end. First Samuel 15, verse 23. Here is how Samuel replies. He tells him, rebellion, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. This sad, stark rebuke, unheeded, served as the prophecy of what would happen to King Saul. He could have re repented. He could have heeded the rebuke, but he didn't. And as a result of that, it ended up going really bad for him, as we, as we will see. Stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Are you stubborn? This is self-reflecting questions. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Are you a rebel at heart? Do you have a problem with when God says things with the word of God? Because notice the, 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 the key component in this verse here. The reason why Saul was rejected, the reason why was not God made an arbitrary choice, but it was because Saul himself had rejected the word of the Lord. That's the reason. He says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. So God made a good choice. He gave him every blessing. Saul is the one who rejected the blessing of God by rejecting the word of the Lord and thereby he lost that blessing of being king. So a lesson here for us today, brothers and sisters, beware of rejecting the word of the Lord. Beware. 
it might feel like it's a small thing. It might feel like it's, oh, excuse it here or justify it here, beware. That's what Saul did. And, and the, the stark warning that Samuel gave him, see, Saul was not aware or awake to the gravity of what he was doing. That's why Samuel spoke so plainly, he says, listen, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. You kill witches in, in, in Israel. Rebellion is like that. That's what you're doing. Uh, stubbornness to, to persist in, in, in trying to justify your course and, and justify it and, and defend it and ex trying to explain it away. That stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And in so doing, you are rejecting the word of God. This is a warning for us, brothers and sisters. And like I said, this served as an omen for what ended up happening at the end and the conclusion of the life of Saul. So what, what uh, transpired after that? I, I hope you're paying attention to the lessons, okay? We're, we're drawing the parallels here because we're seeing the progression of the life of this king. What started off well, and now it's, it's kind, of, kind of going off track. The same could be for us. That's why we need to take note, take measure, okay? Test things, gauge yourself, check your wall. Check the chapters in your biography so far, so to speak. Yeah, examine your life. Uh, here is uh, what the wise man years later said, but the principle holds, and this is actually what we see happen. Proverbs 14, verse 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. And uh, that's exactly what happened because we read back in 1 Samuel 15, 35. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. What a sad verse. Samuel went from the presence of foolish Saul, who was a rebel, who was stubborn, who had rejected the word of the Lord. And since Samuel is the prophet of the Lord, who conveys the word of the Lord, Saul rejected the word of the Lord. So Samuel had no more business to go and see Saul or to commune with him. And so he didn't go to see him anymore. This is, this is an indication. And, and it follows it there, it shows that the, the Lord rejected Saul because Saul had rejected him. In other words, God respected the choice of Saul. And it's sad here how this is expressed. The Lord repented him that he had made Saul king over Israel. Does that remind you of another story in the Bible where God repented that he had done something? I'm talking about the flood, the creation of man just before the flood. And God saw the wickedness of man and the Bible says God repented. So God now, you know, is, is, is mourning. What had started off so well, what could have gone so successfully, and yet Saul turned and slowly, little by little, through self-importance, through pride, through uh, self-justification, excuses, disobeyed and disobeyed and became accustomed to disobeying until he rejected the word of the Lord and basically forced God away from him. A sad, sad tragedy. And uh, the next verse actually tells us that how, how that concluded. Uh, let me read it here. First Samuel 16, 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So the spirit of God was lost to Saul, no, departed. So in other words, the decisions you make in the course of your life, even though you started off well, you can come to a place where you can grieve the spirit of God in such a way that the spirit of God can, de can depart from you. Beware, lest you be a fool like Saul. And then the last part of the verse here, I want to explain it quickly. This is an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. What does that mean? This is an evil spirit. This is an evil angel. And we say, well, how, so God sent him an evil angel to punish him? No, because Saul had rejected the word of the Lord. He, God withdrew his spirit. And that opened up, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity for Satan. Say, so, well, I, I, I want to have, I want to go uh, see him. And God allowed that just like he did with Job earlier on. So when it says an evil spirit uh, from the Lord troubled him, it means an evil spirit that was permitted by the Lord because Saul had rejected the word of the Lord. Now Satan came in and God allowed. God could not say, well, no, Satan, you can't. I'm protecting Saul. Saul is, is with me. You have no jurisdiction here. No, Satan. Well, God was forced out. So God permitted Satan to do what he wanted. And so this was an evil spirit from uh, an evil spirit of Satan permitted by God to trouble Saul. And this is what happened. This is just to explain what's going on. Uh, people sometimes misunderstand some of these things. Uh, Saul had all these habits that he neglected to examine and to lay off. And with the aid and help of the spirit of God, when he, God gave him a new heart and, and he neglected the work that was needed on the inside and he got so caught up in being king and self-importance, he ended up in this tragic situation where now the spirit of God had departed from him. Keep in mind, he still was king. So to all appearances, he still was continuing in the position of king 
and not just appearances, it was functionality as well. And he was operating with leadership, with, with influence and doing this and doing that. And he made many foolish choices as well as king in battles and different things and, and oaths that he took and vows. And he almost killed his son one day because of a foolish vow he did. And so time and again, this continued, but God did not remove him immediately from being king. In like manner, we can have made foolish choices. Uh, rejecting the word of the Lord. And we can continue. And in continuing, we think, well, oh, God is still with me. I'm still doing okay. You know, everything is, is okay. And we can fool ourselves. Beware of that. Be very aware of that. Pride cometh before a fall. And this is what we see in the life of Saul. Another component uh, also, I don't want to neglect to mention, in the life of this sad uh, individual, this uh, King Saul, is as David uh, you know, came on the scene and David uh, killed Goliath and, and David was anointed by Samuel. Uh, Saul didn't know that. He just knew that his kingdom was going to go to someone else. He wasn't aware that it was uh, David as such. But you remember one time uh, they were coming back from battle and, and David was successful. Of course, they killed Goliath and the women were singing. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul heard that and he was very upset. Says they've attributed more to David than me. And he was jealous. Now, jealousy was a very natural progression here from pride, self-importance. It's all about me, me, me. I'm number one. I'm king. Everybody looks to me. As soon as David was praised, and David was the one who won the, uh, the battle. Uh, uh, Saul and all the soldiers in the Israelite army were cowards. Nobody uh, could face up to Goliath. It was uh, the shepherd David who came with his staff and his uh, and his sling. And, in, you know, with the God of Israel, he defeated the, the giant. So, no, of course, he was the brave one. So the women were singing his praises, but Saul was jealous. Jealousy. Jealousy is not something we uh, like to acknowledge. It's not something we like to talk about. But jealousy is a very big problem. Looking at others, comparing ourselves with others. I'm talking just, just in the world, in the church. What is brother such and such doing? What is sister such and such doing? What is he? Do? What does he have? What? Did, where did he go? What's going? And what about me? And jealousy. Jealousy is a very persistent problem. Jealousy caused the undoing of Saul time and again. It was when he was on a chase of David, trying to kill him, that he actually made that confession when David spared his life. I have played the fool. Jealousy is a very, very serious problem. How are you doing in that department? Are you being a fool? Or are you being wise? Saul was playing the fool. And so what a biography that is. I want you to think about it this way. If we had the opportunity to read your life story, to read your biography, maybe put it in a sermon and uh, recount the highlights of your life, what will that sermon contain, I wonder? Will it contain, maybe the title of the sermon will be a life of a fool, God forbid, Will it contain evidences of foolishness and foolish behavior? Or will it contain evidences of success and indeed choices to honor God and to use the blessings of God to bless others? That's a question. I really want us to ponder that. Because brothers and sisters, when we're in the moment, when, when we're right here and now and we make these decisions, we sometimes don't think of, of the bigger picture, especially when we make these foolish, wrong decisions. We, we think of the here and the now and, and oh, the people, they forced me, the situation, how Saul kept justifying himself. I want us to take a step back and look at your whole life. And with the, with the perspective uh, of look at your life at the end of it and look back on your whole life. What are the most important things that you want to stand out in your life? The decisions that you would have made to, 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 to be recounted, to be remembered. And in light of that, make your decision in the here and the now. We don't want to find evidence of foolish behavior and choices any more than we have to in our lives. Look, I, I, we'll, let's be practical, let's be real. We have all made foolish choices along the, along the way, here and there, even after we've become believers, okay? The, the point is this, do we allow that to become the color and the course of our life, that we become actual fools consistently like Saul? Or do we recognize that, acknowledge that, and escape from that to Jesus and, and say, Lord, give me more of your spirit. I surrender even that, that pride, that uh, self-importance, that self-justification, that jealousy, that uh, uh, the lying, like uh, Saul lied, you know, and trying to explain himself and lying and blaming the people and all of that. All these excuses, all these things, they cluster together. They're a grave danger. Beware of that. You see, Saul did not truly, fully surrender to God. Everything was still all about Saul. It was about him. And that was the cause of his jealousy. It's pride 
Pride and jealousy go together, hand in hand. He had not given all to God. He was still trying to stay himself, his importance, it was all about him. And so he was jealous of David. And sadly, finally, we come to the conclusion of the life of this man. And he goes to a witch, the witch of Andor. You remember that? Saul had warned him, uh, Samuel, sorry, the prophet Samuel had warned him. Uh, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And lo and behold, at the conclusion or at the close of his life, Saul finds himself knocking on the door of a witch, seeking an audience with an evil spirit to try and get some word because he was so far gone. Here's the account in Sam, uh, 1 Samuel 28, verses 13 and 14. And I picked this one because it is so tragic. It says, And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sowest thou? This is after the woman said, Who shall I call up for you? And he says, Oh, Samuel. And then she, 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 this is the, the context here. So she sees someone. She says, who did you see? So Saul did not see anyone. He's just going by the word of the woman. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. What a, what a scene. Just picture this. The king of Israel, God's chosen people anointed, chosen and anointed by God. And here he is bowing down before a fallen evil angel. This was a demon. This was a demon impersonating uh, Samuel here, okay? And Saul didn't even see him. He heard the description, he perceived, so he concluded, well, that must be uh, Samuel. So he bowed his head down. And what a scene, just picture the scene, the heavenly, the heavenly host and, and, and in the big great controversy between Christ and Satan and the angels. And here is the king of Israel bowing down before a demon. Uh, what, what a tragedy. The man that had received the spirit of God, he received a new heart, he was changed. He was among the prophets. He had started off so well, he ended up so tragically. Brothers and sisters, don't underestimate the power of sin, the sins that we cherish, the habits that we hold close, that we don't let go of. Don't underestimate how they can ruin your life. This is an absolute ruin for this man. Tragic, tragic story. He's bowing before Satan. It's just, just, just think about it. I, 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 can't, I can't express it uh, starkly enough how, how tragic, absolutely tragic that scene is, how heaven must have felt, how, how the good angels must have felt, how the evil angels must have rejoiced. Th this man was so desperate, was so overwhelmed, was so perturbed, and he, rather than turning to God time and again, he rejected God, he ended up in this miserable situation. You don't want to be like that. What does that mean? As someone said, and put it very well, sin will take you further then you want to go and it will keep you longer than you want to stay and it will cost you more than you're ever wanting to pay and that's exactly what happened to this man Saul the next day was surrounded by armies he was so disheartened he actually asked his armor bearer to kill him the man refused he took his sword he fell on it he committed suicide the enemy came and found him cut his head off spread his armor all over the city and they took his body and they hammered it on the wall of their of their god uh, of the temple of their god this is what happened to Saul. He died the death of a fool. And so, brothers and sisters, this tragic end is recorded for us in the scriptures so that we might not fall into the same trap. I want to share with you a couple of promises here just to, to summarize what we're talking about. Proverbs chapter 1, uh, sorry, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. This is the way of wisdom, as opposed to the way of the fool. Saul foolishly took his own life. He ended his own life. He committed suicide. Because really, it was his own after all. What does that mean? He never committed it fully to God. He never surrendered it to God. He never fully trusted in the Lord with all his heart. He retained something. He kept it. So this is the challenge. This is the appeal here. Let us learn something, something from the story of Saul. Because in the book of Proverbs, we're also told that the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that's exactly what happened with Saul. Is that going to be a, a summary statement of our life at the end? Or oh, they lived the life of a fool. They, they started off well. They, it was great at the beginning. But it ended tragically. Let us, brothers and sisters... 
not just begin the course well, but let us run well to the end. Let us trust the Lord. Let us commit all to him. Let us allow the Lord to heal us from our pride, from our selfishness, from our self-importance, from our justification. Let's take responsibility for when we make mistakes. Let us let the Lord heal us from our jealousy. All these things are the hallmarks of a life of a fool. Now I'll summarize them here. These, these habits, beware of these habits, beware of these traits. If you have any of that, go to the Lord in prayer. Trust him. He will deliver you. Self-importance and pride. Soul manifested that time and again. Disobedience and stubbornness and disobedience and justifying it and explaining it away and giving every other excuse under the sun except uh, truly repenting. And this is why many times in the life of Saul, his repentance was nothing but an outward appearance. He did not have true, sincere repentance. He, he didn't like being told off in front of the people. And he repented to make an appearance. Self-justification, as we said, and of course, jealousy. Beware of jealousy. Jealousy is one of those things that uh, seems to be ever-present and yet hard to detect, especially among believers. You see that in uh, many times, the story, I'm thinking of the story of, of the publican and the, the Pharisee that went to pray. What happened was the Pharisee was comparing himself with the publican and he felt so much better about himself because he saw this poor publican. Je this is an element of jealousy. What does that mean? Comparing oneself with others and trying to match up with others. Let me tell you something. Forget about others for a minute. Think about yourself and your relationship with God. Trust in the Lord. Others can cause you your downfall by looking at them. Okay, uh, Saul looked at David. What was happening with David? Where is he going? Chasing him. I want to make sure I, I try and find him, catch him. And there was like this, this, this competition for superiority. Beware of jealousy. Beware of competition, that competitive spirit. In spiritual things, in the church, there is a danger of having a competitive spirit. You realize that? Is this, this is not just something in the world with the business and the people in the corporate world and climb the corporate ladder and competition. There is competition in spiritual things. Beware. It stems from, it's, it's a, an expression of jealousy, which stems from pride, self-importance. So I want to share these things with you, brothers and sisters. This biography, this life of this king of Israel, the first king of Israel, absolute tragedy, has so, so many lessons for us. Let us heed the lessons. Let us trust in the Lord. Let us examine our hearts. Forget examining others and, oh, yes, I know such and such uh, brother or sister. They should have heard the sermon today. Yeah, because that applies to them. Forget about that. Look at your life. Look at your experience. Are you playing the fool? Are you deceiving yourself? The worst kind of deception is, is self-deception. Look at the end of your life and look back on, on the course of your life. You know, think about it. Uh, when, when your life comes to a, cl to a close, what are the outstanding things that you want to be remembered for? Not foolish things. So in light of that, make your decisions today. So I want to appeal with you, to you and I want to challenge you with this thought. Let us have indeed that trust, that confidence, that assurance, and the full commitment and surrender to Christ so that he might heal all our failures, our faults, our character, uh, you know, faults and failures that are embedded in our in our very being christ can go down and heal all of that to the measure and to the level that we surrender to him let us make a full wholehearted surrender let's pray together as we conclude eternal father we thank you so much that you are honest and faithful in relaying to us even the sad stories of those who start off well and yet end so badly Thank you for the story of Saul, and it is such a tragic story, but we thank you that we can look at it and learn deep and important lessons from it. Lord, help us not to end up like that. Help us not to be fools in our choices, in our decisions, in how we have a relationship with you and a relationship with others. Please bless us and heal us from whatever uh, uh, character faults or uh, habits or struggles that we might have in our personal life. Help us to acknowledge them, not to explain them away, not to justify them. Help us to acknowledge them, recognize them, and hand them over to you and surrender that. And your promise is that you will heal us and you will uplift us. Help us indeed to trust in you with all our heart, to not lean on our own understanding, and for you to direct our paths. We thank you that this promise is faithful and true because we ask it in the wonderful name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, Turn notifications on and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus.